Okay. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Okay, great. Claire can hear me. Um, all right, everyone, I just wanted to welcome you to the uh, Ford Hunter virtual lecture series. Um, our next one's going to be on Tuesday, February 8th. Uh, Dave Beiser is going to be talking about John Harris Jr., the, the son of Harris Burke's founder. Um, and uh, check out all of the uh, uh, the events it's on fordhunter.org this event or this uh, lecture will be posted on there afterwards the recording of it um, and stick around after um, Dr. Jance is finished talking we'll have a little Q&A uh, in the chat um, and uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Uh, Claire Jance she's a professor of geography at Shippensburg University and she'll be talking to us about uh, beekeeping from here uh, Dr. Jance would you like to start sharing your screen now yes Let and while Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry, so Barbara. Carter, thank you, Carter, <laughs> for introducing. Not working at all. It's very oh, choppy. Well. If you have something you want to say, you can put in the chat, and I'll I'll, I'll say it out loud. <laughs> all right. I should I go ahead and get started, or no? I see. I think uh, I think we should be. Um, Okay, I'm going to turn off my camera and mute my. All right. Um, well, thanks everyone, and thanks to um, to Barbara for the invite. And um, I'll just say right off the bat that I'm not a historian, and I know that you all are really interested in history. Um, Barbara shared with me that there was a lot of interest in beekeeping since. Uh, beekeeping is something we've been doing as humans for thousands of years um, and uh, and I don't know uh, you know a whole lot about that history but what I am going to talk about today a little bit is kind of my experience as a, a backyard beekeeper since about 2005 with varying levels of uh, success over that time period so um, I guess one other thing I'll say is that um, we, we should have plenty of time for questions at the end um, before we close at eight o'clock. But if you have a question um, and you want to pop it in the chat, I'm trying to keep an eye on that and I can try to address those either as I'm going along or as we're um, as we wrap up at the end. So um, so thanks again for the invite. And let's start out with um, what we are talking about. Um, this is a uh, a meme that has gone around on, on the, the internet a little bit that I really uh, like because, um, you know, a lot of people when they're out in their yard and they see a yellow thing with stripes on it, they immediately call it a honeybee or a bee. Um, but this, oops, sorry, this little fella right here is, um, is a honeybee. And the distinguishing characteristics of the honeybee is that it kind of has a fuzzy um, thorax. A lot of times you'll see pollen in her pollen sacs. Um, and, you know, they get confused pretty often with yellow jackets. Um, and yellow jackets are just not very nice. Uh, honeybees tend to be pretty gentle and will, um, you know, stay out of your way if you uh, don't don't harass them. And so this, these are the girls we're talking about today. So I wanted to start out um, with um, what is going on inside of a hive. And actually, let me back up a minute. Um, this hive right here is what we use in our yard. It's, um, it's a very commonly used hive called a Langstroth hive. There's, there's a few, there's several different kinds of hives that, that, that different beekeepers use, but we like the Langstroth hive because it's, you can take the whole thing apart, which makes inspections really easy. It makes honey harvesting really easy. They're expandable. Um, and so I, so, so this is what we use. And so, so when we open up one of these um, these are all individual boxes, um, and I just use uh, regular um, house outdoor house paint to, to paint the hives, and we just paint them whatever color we, we, we have to happen to have on hand. So 
so this is our, uh, you know, kind of uh, near the entrance of our hives. And like I said, when you open up the top, this is what you see, you know, it's just kind of a box full of bees. And these are uh, what we call frames. And all of those frames are removable. So you can pull them out and inspect them, uh, look for the queen, look for any problems in the hive. Um, and, uh, and so, so, but this is the top before you actually break into it. Um, there's different kinds of bees inside of a hive. Um, uh, the most kind of uh, well-known bee is the queen bee. And um, this is a photo that we captured of one of our queens. You can tell that she's a commercial queen. That is, we, we purchased her along with a package of bees um, because she has a red dot on her thorax. Uh, queen bees that are commercial bees that you purchase will have a dot on them. Usually beekeepers will select a, a color that they use for a particular year. Um, and all of the queen bees are sort of that, that color. And then you can, it makes her easier to find, obviously. Um, the other characteristics about the queen are that she has a very long abdomen, <laughs> right? Um, and the life of a queen is actually she is not really in charge of very much in the hive. She is really doing the will of the worker bees. And uh, she is usually surrounded by a, a small cohort of attendant bees that kind of make sure that she's fed, make sure that she's groomed. And they also sort of shuttle her around to where she needs to be in the hive. And her primary job is to uh, lay eggs. Um, the queen, uh, if bees can actually raise new queens in the hive, so if something happens to this queen, they could um, they could raise a new queen from eggs that she had laid previously. So one of her daughters, um, they could raise her to be a new queen. Queens typically only leave the hive one time. Um, they will uh, leave the hive on a mating flight and then mate with uh, several different males usually, and they keep all of those eggs stored inside their bodies and um, fertilize them or not fertilize them, more on that later, um, when they lay an egg. And her abdomen is um, extra long so that she can reach down to the bottom of one of these cells and uh, deposit an egg. And again, that's her entire job. That's her entire life. The worker bees, which we see here, are, um, are in control of how many eggs she lays, of where she lays eggs, and they also control whether she lays a male or a female um, bee. So, so that's the life of a queen. It's basically you leave once, you have a great time while you're out, but you come back and you're, the rest of your life is spent laying eggs for the hive. Um, queen bees usually live around two or three years before they are, they kind of run out of, of egg supply and are ultimately replaced. Um, so this is another uh, picture. This is one of my favorite um, photos that we've taken because this is in a, in a nursery uh, section of the hive. These cells right here, have been capped over. And you can see right here in the middle of the photo is a, is a bee, a worker bee that is um, emerging. So this is her first few seconds out of, um, you know, in, in the world. Um, this bee next to her um, probably came out just a little bit ago uh, and is now doing her first job as a worker bee, which is cleaning up after herself. Uh, so the first thing they do is they clean out the cell that they emerge from, and, uh, and then that's ready again for another egg to go in it or for um, honey and nectar storage. Most of the bees in a hive are uh, female. So um, these worker bees, you know, anywhere from 90 to 95 percent of the population of the hive will be female. So this is a, a woman's world inside of a hive. Um, and like I said, these worker bees are um, 
are uh, kind of quote unquote in charge of most of the activities that happen inside of a hive. When a worker bee is born, like I said, she goes to work right away, um, cleans up after herself, um, and then they kind of cycle through different jobs. Um, they, they start out usually in the nursery, um, taking care of the, um, of the eggs and the larvae and making sure that they're all fed, um, helping uh, you know, new bees emerge. Um, then they might go on to become a guard bee where they guard the entrance of the hive, or they might go out and, um, and be a forager or a scout bee um, collecting honey or looking for food sources. In the summertime, um, these female worker bees do such an incredible amount of flying that their wings usually uh, wear out in about three or four weeks. And so in the summertime, the lifespan of a worker bee is very short. Um, but as we get into the fall season, um, we will have worker bees that live for several months over the winter time to get back to work in the spring. Um, when a worker bee is laid, when that egg is laid, that egg is fertilized. So the queen bee determines the sex of a, of a bee by whether or not she fertilizes the egg or not. So the eggs are kept separate from the sperm that she collected when she mated. And uh, she is basically, quote unquote, told to lay uh, a, a fertilized egg or non-fertilized egg based really on the size of these cells. So these cells are worker bee sized cells. And so the queen bee knows that she needs to fertilize the egg um, and create a female, um, a female worker bee. If she doesn't fertilize the egg, and I think I have a slide later that shows the different cell sizes, um, it will be a male bee. And this guy in the middle is our male bee. This is called a drone, and you can see he is much bigger than his sisters, the worker bees, and he also has giant eyes. And the drone has uh, one job, which is to mate with queens, virgin queens from other uh, hives. So uh, male bees live their lives, uh, you know, a, a day in the life of a drone is that he is groomed and fed and taken care of by his sisters. He will leave the hive during the day and go to a hangout spot that is called a drone loafing area. Um, and they will, they'll, uh, he'll, he'll congregate with drones from other hives and just hang out there until they see or sense um, through pheromones a virgin queen on her mating flight. And then uh, and then all the drones will go after her. Like I said, she'll mate with several drones. If a drone is successful in mating in, with a queen, um, that mating process kills him. It basically rips his abdomen apart. So if he's successful, he dies. <laughs> but he goes out in a blaze of glory, right? Um, if he does not mate with a queen, as we get into the fall season, um, his sisters in the hive don't want to have to take care of him over the winter time when food, food is scarce and they need to preserve their stores of honey. Um, so there, in the fall, there's what's called the massacre of the drones, where all of the drones get booted out of the hive um, and they, they die because their sisters aren't taking care of them anymore. Um, and in the, in the spring, they will uh, raise up a new set of drones. And like I said, um, you know, only about 5 to 10% of the population within a hive is made up of males of drones. And drones don't have stingers. Um, so if you, if you run across a drone um, loafing somewhere, usually near a water source, um, he, he's not interested in anything but, but the queen and, uh, and can't even sting you. So here is a photo of um, a frame that has a bunch of eggs in it. And these um, upper and sort of smaller cells are uh, worker bee cells. 
Um, and these larger cells are for drones. And the worker bees build this, um, uh, build all of the honeycomb. And so, you know, they determine the size of the cells. And again, that's what cues the queen of whether or not she should fertilize an egg and lay a worker bee which is a female or not fertilize the bee, not fertilize the egg and lay a drone. Um, yeah, drone, the drone hangout, Deb, is usually a sunny spot, um, often near water. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's pretty, uh, it's just a nice comfy spot where they can, uh, where they can hang out. I don't know if it's high up or low down. I would guess that it's higher up. Um, so that they can catch the scent of a, uh, of a queen as she's flying by. So just to review, um, inside of the hive, we have these three different types of bees. We have the female worker bee um, who makes up, they make up most of the hive. We have the queen bee whose only job is to lay eggs. And then we have the drone whose only job is to, um, is to mate with the queens. So that's a quick snapshot of what's going on inside of a hive. Um, now, if we take a look at bees at work, I'm sure you all know that um, that honeybees, in particular, are um, are are lead pollinators, and that you know much of our agricultural system relies on bees pollinating um, fruits and nuts and vegetables. Um, the reason that bees are motivated to do that is because they use um, nectar and pollen as food sources. Um, obviously, nectar gets turned into honey, and they store as much honey as possible so that they can, you know, use that store to get through um, the winter and to the spring where, where they come out again. Um, the bees that I keep in my backyard, again, we will run, you know, maybe two or three hives. We're very small-scale beekeepers. But our, um, our agricultural industry needs a lot more bees. And so you may have seen uh, truckloads of bees, and especially if you're from South Central Pennsylvania. Um, commercial scale beekeepers make most of their money from renting out their hive for pollination. And um, the bees will be driven on trailers across the United States. Usually they kind of get started in the south and then they follow the, uh, you know, the fruit blooming season up north and the same thing kind of happens on the west coast. So they'll start in the south and pollinate citrus trees and then they'll gradually make their way up pollinating different types of fruit trees. Um, we'll have, you know, boxes of bees delivered to Adams County to help um, pollinate our, our, our fruits in the fruit belt. And the Central Valley of California is another place where, um, where bees kind of have to be brought in. Um, they have to be brought in because the, the density of pollination that needs to happen is so high. Typically, like if you're not using your bees in that kind of landscape, um, you would have one hive per acre. That's kind of a sustainable, or no, sorry, seven hives per acre is kind of a sustainable level of, of beehives. But, um, you know, beehives get put into, you know, at a very high density into situations like this. This is an almond grove in California where there's a very high density of beehives because there's a very high density of of uh, flowers that need to be pollinated all at one time. Um, and so again, very um, important in the Central Valley of California and very important in places like Washington State and in Pennsylvania where we, where we grow a lot of, of fruit. Um, and again, I, I mentioned that commercial beekeepers make most of their money from renting out their beehives for pollination. Um, last year, the cost um, that beekeepers were charging uh, almond growers was between $140 and $215 per hive. 
to pollinate their almonds. And so, you know, we've got four hives here, four hives here, and, you know, down through the line. So this almond grower is paying tens of thousands of dollars to have, um, have those almonds pollinated. And then when the, um, when the flowers are done, the beekeeper will come and pick up these hives and take them uh, to the next uh, crop that needs to be needs to be fertilized. So honey is kind of not not the main goal for commercial scale beekeeping. The main goal for commercial scale beekeepers is uh, is pollination. Um, we keep track of our bees at work. Um, so we have our uh, our hives on a feed scale so we can weigh them uh, kind of actually in the springtime we weigh them every day um, to see how they are uh, bringing in nectar because you know once they start to get active during the spring they can put on weight very quickly and so what we're looking at in this chart this is um, the day of the year day one is uh, is January 1st and day 365 at the other end is December. Um, and this, uh, this red line is kind of an adjusted curve. So you can sort of see the sort of net gain and loss over the season. The blue line is, um, is daily gain. And this is still a record breaking day for us. <laughs> um, on May 29th, 2013, our hives put on over 20 pounds of nectar in a single day. And so this was a day when the bees, we had a huge population of bees and everything was blooming and they were just working their butts off and bringing in all of that nectar and pollen so that, and again, in a single day, they put on about 20 pounds. Usually in the spring, you know, we're looking at weight gains between five and 10 pounds per day. Um, depending on weather, but this was a real, a real record breaker <laughs> that day. Um, so, so that's that's what 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 our bees look like. And you know, from from my perspective, we we harvest honey from our bees usually in the fall. We make sure to leave them with plenty of honey um, to make it through the winter, uh, so we don't take off very much. Occasionally, we'll take off um, beeswax and make like little wax candles or, or things like that. But but we mostly um, have our bees for uh, mostly for enjoyment and and also for the honey. So um, let's take a look at kind of the sad part of the of beekeeping, um, which is threats to honeybees. I'm sure you all know that um, that there's a lot of concern about honeybees because of, well, a number of different things. Um, one major threat is um, pesticides and herbicides. And I saw one question about um, whether or not you can uh, keep honeybees near places where uh, spraying for mosquitoes happens. And I don't know what they use um, for mosquitoes. You might want to, you know, look to see what kind of pe uh, pesticide that is and see if it's something bees can pollinate. Um, pesticides and herbicides are definitely, um, can be very toxic to bees. You know, pesticides, especially a pesticide that's targeting insects. These are insects, so um, so it can uh, it can uh, it can take out a hive. We've we've had this happen, I think, one time, and from the way that it looks, is that you have a perfectly healthy hive one day, and then the next day all of your bees are dead, um, and and that just happens because when the bees go out and forage usually they'll find, you know, there'll be a couple of different forage spots that many of the bees from the hive go to. And if they are exposed to a pesticide, they can bring that back into the hive and essentially, um, you know, spread the pesticide throughout the hive and everybody dies. So that's, it's pretty characteristic. And, and like I said, we've, we've seen that happen um, once uh, with, our, with our hives, fortunately only once. Um, Bees are also, we have a problem with bees because they have relatively low genetic diversity. 
So honeybees um, that we have that you know that we we see all the time are um, are actually European in origin. So they're all European honeybees um, that have been uh, raised up from you know a very narrow uh, lineage. So low genetic diversity is a problem because um, it means that there's not a lot of adaptive capacity for bees to adapt to um, things like, uh, well, like climate change um, or pests and diseases that might show up. Um, and so this, this guy here, actually, you can see this little brown dot on the back of these bees here. Um, that's a varroa mite. Uh, its Latin name is varroa destructor because these are very destructive to, to honeybee colonies. Um, the varroa mite, you can see they kind of attach onto the thorax of, of bees and just, um, you know, kind of suck their blood. Um, this certainly lowers the, um, the health of the bees. It makes them more susceptible to diseases. And these varroa mites can actually also carry diseases with them that can be transmitted, um, you know, to the individuals when they when they latch on. Um, the treatment for varroa mites, there's a there's the, there are chemical ways to treat varroa mites that is basically using a low level pesticide that's enough to take out the mites. Um, it can weaken the bees as well, but it's not supposed to kill them if you're using it correctly. Um, there's also, you know, we we have used in the past um, uh, powdered sugar, where you just you basically just dump a bunch of powdered sugar into the hives that covers the bees with powdered sugar. They clean themselves and clean each other, and in doing that, they knock the mites off. The mites fall to the bottom, and then you can put um, like a, a sticky mat at the bottom to catch the mites that you then remove. So, so we've used that with, with some success, but varroa mites are kind of endemic. They're everywhere now. I think they're originally from, uh, from Asia. Um, and, uh, and we, um, I lost my train of thought because I'm looking at the chat too. <laughs> um, so anyway, varroa mites are endemic, they're everywhere, um, and it's something that, that all beekeepers uh, deal with. And it contributes to, in Pennsylvania, statewide, um, over the winter months, we will lose anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of the hives in Pennsylvania. And um, that's partly due to the presence of this kind of, like the chronic presence of, of things like varroa mites. Um, that just kind of weaken the immune system essentially of the hives and uh, and causes them to um, to be weak um, and they can't fight off other other diseases. Um, when when we lost our bees to pesticides, um, we I mean all the bees were dead, so we basically cleaned it out. Um, we and then we uh, removed the wax from the frames, the wax can actually accumulate um, chemicals and pesticides and herbicides. And so it's good to refresh your equipment every so often because the, the beeswax in particular can, um, can absorb all of that stuff. Um, we also freeze all of our equipment um, on, a, on, a, on a frequent basis. If we're not using it, we'll put it in, uh, in, in freezer storage to help to knock back um, pests and diseases. So beekeeping today is um, is pretty tough because of, of of some of these challenges that that we don't really have good solutions for, um, and we are a lot of I know colony collapse disorder was a uh, has been uh, a, an issue, but today colony collapse disorder seems to kind of run in and cycles. So there'll be sort of a big blow up of colony collapse disorder. And nowadays, colony collapse disorder doesn't really seem to be that much of an issue, certainly not what it was five or 10 years ago. Um, and they also linked, by my understanding is that they linked colony collapse disorder to um, sort of low 
uh, hive health related to things like varroa mites, but also to kind of a complex of viruses and other diseases um, that, that would just attack the bees. And, uh, but I don't think we really understand 100% um, what, uh, what the impact or how exactly how colony collapse disorder works. So, um, as I said, the, the honeybees that we are so familiar with are, are themselves non-native, right? They're, they're imported from Europe. And this little infographic shows the diversity of native bees that we have in North America. So um, keeping European honeybees is, is a little bit, I don't know, um, like if you're an ecologist, you're basically keeping an invasive species in your yard. Um, there, I think there is some evidence that European honeybees compete with native bees for, um, for food resources. Um, and so, uh, and, and certainly native bees are subject to the same, a lot of the same uh, challenges that we face with European honeybees in terms of diseases and things like that. Um, the reason we don't use native bees the same way that we use or keep European honeybees is because um, they, they are often solitary. So honey, European honeybees live in a big colony. Um, they pack in all of the honey. Uh, many of these other bees are, are solitary bees or they live in much smaller groups so that they don't accumulate or store the honey product that we like to have. And they're also certainly not as effective as, um, as pollinators for kind of our, our modern agricultural systems. So, um, so they are important, you know, potentially as a, you know, for, for biodiversity, but there's, uh, it, it's, it would be hard to, to, to select some of our native bees and use them in the same way that we use uh, European honeybees. Okay, I think I have time for one of the things that we get asked about the most, which is swarming. And uh, Deb, I've interacted with Deb Cornelius um, because who's here tonight because she, she has a wild hive that swarmed tremendously a couple years ago. Um, swarming is the way that honeybees reproduce colonies. So if you have a colony that is swarming, it actually means that that colony is, um, is really healthy and has a great population and is ready to, um, you know, take a, a subset of those bees and, and set up a new colony. When you're inspecting a hive in the spring, swarming usually happens in the spring in May and June. Um, and these cells right here at the bottom of this frame are uh, swarm cells. These are actually cells where queen bees have been raised up. And what happens during a swarm is that the original queen of the hive will leave. Well, first of all, the workers have the queen lay her replacement basically in these uh, swarm cells. And, um, and then a few days before these hatch, the original queen will leave the hive and will attach herself, you know, up onto a landing place, usually several feet up in the air. Um, and then a group of worker bees will cluster around her. And as this cluster is kind of hanging out, there's actually scout bees that are leaving the cluster and going out to look for new hive locations, a new place to set up a colony. Um, and then they will come back to the cluster and communicate to the cluster, um, you know, about the places that they found, about the candidate sites. Some of you may have heard of the bee dance. Um, and the, the bee dance is how bees communicate with each other. Um, it's basically a movement of their bodies that tells other bees, you know, how far away and in what direction 
a food sources or a potential new location for um, for a hive. So you know you have a scout bee go out, uh, she comes back, she found a place that's pretty good, she does a bee dance, telling the other bees where to go look. You might get other scout bees going out there, and then basically it's it's almost like a, like a democratic process. <laughs> where the site that gets the most attention or votes from from those scout bees um, is the site that they will typically uh, relocate to. But again, it's not the queen making those decisions. It's the worker bees as a collective making those decisions of when to swarm and when they swarm where to um, set up a new colony. After she leaves and those bees set up a new house, um, these queens will emerge. Sometimes a virgin queen will take additional swarms out of the hive, um, but then eventually one of these virgin queens will settle down and uh, become the new queen of the old hive. Um, she'll go out on a mating flight, and then within a few weeks after hatching will be um, you know, laying up, laying eggs and raising up new, uh, new bees. There can only be one queen in the hive. So if one of these queens emerges first, she might um, actually kill the remaining queens before they even emerge if she's the one who's going to take over. So, um, so it's, again, sort of a, um, a rough, rough life, I think, where, for, uh, for the queen. Um, this is just a shot from our backyard when we um, had a swarm. So our hive um, is actually down here off to the left, uh, not in the picture. It threw a swarm, uh, and then they landed up here in this cherry tree. You can see my husband at the top of that ladder um, holding a cardboard box, and that is what we do if they're up in a tree, we knock them, we just kind of jiggle the limb or sometimes we'll cut the limb and put the limb into a box and then um, we'll just kind of dump them into um, a, new, uh, a new hive here. Um, so that's, that's kind of the process of catching a swarm if they're um, outside. And then we close it up. And typically what we do, you can see this hive has some, um, has a branch in front of it. We'll put a branch in front of the hive so that the bees can, uh, it, it forces the bees to reorient so that they can find their way back. And this is what looks, what a, a forming swarm looks like on the outside of one of our hives. Um, they all just kind of come together um, and then they will lift off at one time when the queen leaves the hive. Um, and it sounds like, well, nowadays it sounds like one of those drones that are flying around taking pictures of us. Um, but it, it's, it's definitely a sound that you, uh, you cannot miss. And like I said, bees will um, sort of decide to find a new place to set up shop. Sometimes they don't make the right choice. Um, this is an example of a um, of a swarm that uh, they where they set up shop just on the, on a tree. They're not really sheltered, and so this particular swarm probably wouldn't survive the winter um, uh, as as it is so exposed. So. Um, you may have had an instance or know of an instance where you have bees that have moved into to a house or into a structure. Um, and this guy, the Bartlett Bee Whisperer, is a beekeeper down, I think he's based in Georgia. Um, and he always shares his swarm removal um, projects. And he has a lot of really cool equipment to help him with this. In this case, you can see the side of this brick house. There are bees coming and going right here in this gap in the bricks. Um, he has infrared cameras that he uses to take photographs of, um, 
of walls like this or, or of structures so that he can find where the main body of the hive is. And you can see here's the entrance that you see bees coming and going from, but over here is the main body of the hive. Um, so if you were just trying to get rid of these bees and you know spraying pesticide into that hole, you're not gonna be very successful because most of the bees are over here. And also if you destroy them, you're gonna have, you know, many pounds of honey kind of melting in your in your walls. So unfortunately, if you have a bee colony set up in your walls, really the only way to deal with it effectively is to is to open up the walls and remove um, the hive. And so that's what um, what the Bartlett Bee Whisperer does. You can see he, in this case, he was removing bricks. And he kept removing bricks to expose the whole body of the hive. Uh, and we've done this, I don't have such good pictures. We've done this a couple of times where we've, um, once was in a basement and what was once was in a shed where we actually had to remove drywall uh, to expose the hive. And then we do just what he does, where he kind of cuts the comb and straps it into frames and then puts the frames into boxes that he then uh, takes home with him. And then he has a new hive and the people who own the house uh, have to re-brick this area, but they have all the bees and all the honey um, out of their uh, out of their uh, their house. So um, that is the conclusion of my presentation. Um, I do have a YouTube channel where I have posted not very many, but just a few videos of um, of uh, hive capturing or swarm capturing at uh, at Deb's house that we did a couple years ago. Um, and I can put in a link to that channel, um, you know, as we take questions. So I think we have about 15 minutes left. And um, I see one question in the chat of how do you extract the honey and beeswax? So, um, we have an extractor. Um, well, first of all, the frames that we use are, um, are wooden frames that um, has a base of plastic in the middle that has the shape of, uh, of, of honeycomb um, kind of pressed onto it. And the bees use that as a basis to draw out, to basically build their wax comb. And um, the uh, the wax uh, we and and when we extract it, we we put those frames into a wax into an extractor, which is like a big centrifuge. Basically, we hand turn it, and the honey flings out of um, of the the frames and kind of runs down the sides of the extractor, and then we can drain it out and filter it. We filter our honey, but we don't heat it up or homogenize it. So it's, it's raw honey, but it is, it's filtered just because there's like bee bark bits and wax bits in there. Um, and then again, we can reuse that, that frame. It makes it easier for the bees because they don't have to rebuild the wax. But as I mentioned, the, um, the wax can accumulate um, toxins over time. So, uh, so we usually will sort of scrape those frames down or purchase um, new frames uh, so to, to, to kind of force the bees to make, make new wax. And then if we want to, we can use that old wax and we'll melt it down. Again, that has to be filtered um, and use it for candles or little crafty things like that. Um, okay, so Melissa, what advice would you give to first time beekeepers? Um, and that you have some used equipment and hives, I would love to hear your best starter advice. So Melissa, what you're going to find is that every beekeeper you talk to has the right way to do things. And um, there are a number of books that, um, that I really 
love that are just good reads. Let me see if I can find this. Um, it's good to, uh, you know, do some reading. Well, I, what I would say is it's good to do some reading of the of some of the classic books because some of the books that we have found um, really uh, give you a good uh, idea of what, let's see, of what, um, what's going on inside of a hive and what you can expect. So one book that we recommend is The Beekeeper's Handbook. That is kind of a classic. Um, and another one is The Backyard Beekeeper. And another one is Backyard Beekeeping. Um, so that's what I would recommend is to, sorry about those links, that's really obnoxious. Um, that, uh, that I would recommend is to just read some of those books so you get an idea of what to expect and how to do stuff, but ultimately it's, it's a lot of trial and error. Um, Claire, do you mind if I read you some of the earlier questions just so we can get those two um, yes. out of the way? Yes, please. I'm having, I'm having trouble seeing oh, everything no, the, on the chat. On the um, someone had asked a little earlier, um, when you're in your hive, your man-made ones, does the queen hang out in a particular location, middle, top, bottom? Yeah, like that? that's a really good question. So typically what happens whoops, is that they, they want to move up. So um, if, you, if you have, it, usually you'll have, you'll start the spring with a couple of boxes and then as they bring in more honey and nectar, you kind of stack those boxes up. But the queen always kind of wants to move up in the hive. So you start down here in the spring, but by the fall, she's usually up in the middle or upper middle part of the hive. So some beekeepers will, um, in the fall, will do what they call reversing. Well, they'll take the upper boxes and put them down at the bottom and then put the bottom boxes up at the top. Up at the top. These bottom boxes will be kind of empty-ish um, as the queen and the rest of the bees move up. But it just seems to be their instinct to sort of move up. Um, you can always kind of get an idea at least of where the queen is or has been recently by the presence of, of eggs and larvae. Um, on the frames. So, you know, you'll, you'll have some, some frames that will be, you know, all honey or nectar or pollen, but then as you sort of work down, then you'll get into some frames that have that brood in it. And even if you don't see the queen, you know that she's there because you see evidence of her being there. Um, and someone else had asked, um, what kind of places does the, does the drone hang out? The, like a tree or like is there any is there any um you know is it near water or something like that yeah usually it's i i mean i i i don't actually know but um but i think that um I, well i know what i've read in the book but i haven't actually encountered a, a drone loafing area except for like around my pond they do like to hang out around around the pond so i think that they want a nice a warm spot um, near water. Maybe they might try to go higher up so that they can, you know, catch wind of the queen. But um, but yeah, maybe I, I, I'm not exactly 100% sure. I'm going to post in the link in the chat. Um, this is a link to a Google Doc that I put together for a friend of mine, um, which is kind of a list of equipment and some reading um, and clothing and stuff um, for, uh, for beginner beekeepers. Not all the links might work anymore, but it just gives an idea of, of what we recommended um, when he was setting up a hive. Um, and someone had all um, jumped in and asked in the chat, and I also um, am curious myself, uh, the smoking. Do you use it often? Um, do you use it a lot? Is it something that is, you find necessary or optional? Yeah, so um, in this photo, you can see I've got a smoker um, in my in my hand here, and um, that 
so smoking the hive um, is used to quote unquote calm the bees down. Um, and if you've been beekeeping for a while, you will know if you have to go out to do an inspection and you pop the lid of the hive off, you will know what kind of mood the bees are in <laughs> by the sound that they're making. Um, they, they, they will, it just sounds angrier. So if, if I'm getting the sense that the bees are angry, then I will use smoke. Um, the way that this works um, is that when you, when, you, when you put smoke in the hive, it, um, it kind of triggers an instinct with, um, with the bees to prepare that they're, they're like, our hive is being, you know, something is happening and we may have to leave. So they will gorge themselves with, uh, with nectar. They'll fill up their gullets with nectar. And then um, if, if, if their bellies are full, they can't sting you as easily because they just don't have the mobility in their abdomen to sting you as easily. Um, smoke also will drive the bees off of the frame. So you can, um, you know, if I wanted to take a look at this box, I would smoke the bees and they would move further down. So it's also a way to kind of control or to encourage the bees to, um, to move off of, of a certain area of the hive so that you can see what's going on there. Um, the smoke that we use is just, um, I mean, it's just smoke. It's like uh, wood chips and maybe some leaves. It's nothing, it's nothing special. Uh, do you know any places that people could buy bees locally instead of having them shipped? Um, that's a really good question. We, we've gotten the, the closest place that we have found bees. We're, we're down in Shippensburg and um, there's a, a, an apiary called Beams Bees. Beams, B-E-A-M. Um, and they sell local, what are called local hybrids. So that means that they are bees that have overwintered um, and are kind of adapted to the mid-Atlantic climate. Um, and there's, uh, there's we, we've also bought bees from the South. We've had them mailed in. Um, we've also arranged pickups while, uh, while, while vendors are, are moving packages of bees up North. A lot of times, sometimes when you purchase bees, even if you purchase them locally, they might be, um, they still might be coming from the South. So that's why we like beans bees because they're, um, they're, they're, they're local bees. <laughs> and so they're, they're already adapted to the, to the climate here. Um, I have a couple of private comments. One is from Laura. Um, of how often you have to interact with the hive. So, and what kind of time commitment is, is, so the thing for the time commitment, there's a, there's a pretty significant kind of startup cost in terms of time and money to buy all the equipment that you need and those hive boxes and the frames and building the frames and painting everything. Um, and then the, the, the times that you work the most with the bees are in the spring and in the fall. So usually in the spring, um, we will do a full hive inspection. So we'll open up the boxes when it's warm enough and, uh, you know, see if we can find the queen, see if she's laying already, determine if we might need to requeen to bring in a new queen, um, uh, you know, just to check the overall health of the hive. Um, and then throughout the summer, um, the main thing is making sure that the bees have enough space. So you have to, that's the other nice thing about having them on a scale is that, you know, after the bees have put on about 25 or 30 pounds, you need to put another box up there to give them enough room to store additional honey and nectar that's coming in. Um, we would then typically maybe just check in on the hives every, you know, maybe, maybe a, two or three times over the, the summer. And then in the fall, that's typically when we would do the reversal um, and, and kind of do a fall cleanup. That's also typically when we harvest honey. Some beekeepers harvest honey in the spring because that's when they put on most of the, the weight. But, um, but we kind of like the taste of fall honey because it has kind of a different mix of, you know, it has, it has 
it has clovers, but it also has um, some of the fall asters, and it gives the honey a different flavor that we, we just like to, to have. Um, I'm seeing a question from Lou, or no, I thought I saw, oh, from April about what needs to be done to the boxes for winter in central Pennsylvania. Um, we don't do anything to the boxes in central Pennsylvania. We don't wrap them. Um, we will, um, will reduce the size of their entrances, um, and we make sure that they have enough, um, honey to get them through the winter for we we're pretty generous we make sure that our bees have at least 90 pounds of honey um to uh to make it through the winter and like i said we just reduce the entrances to keep the drafts down and to keep the mice out um, but otherwise the bees are really good at thermoregulating they will in the winter time they will form a cluster and um they will shiver so they'll kind of shake their bodies and they'll, um, you know, rotate in to the center where it's warmest and then rotate out and let, you know, sort of circulate through like that. And that's how they keep warm. If it warms up enough in the wintertime, maybe it gets to, you know, 50 degree, a 50 degree day, the bees will break the cluster and, um, and we'll, uh, we'll come out and like use the bathroom and stuff and then come back into the hive and, and, and reform that cluster for when it, when it gets cold again. But I've heard from some beekeepers who have put thermometers into the middle of that cluster in the winter time and it's 90 degrees in the middle. So, um, so they're, they're very good at, um, at, uh, at thermoregulating both in the winter time and, uh, and keeping cool enough in the summertime. Okay, um, I, I'm seeing eight o'clock. So, um, Carter, I don't know if you wanna, wanna close out. There's a couple different, there's a couple more comments in here. Um, I'm happy to, to answer. Um, um, yeah, so we're probably gonna end it here. If you wanna take this, the one more question, um, maybe the one about robbing from Luke. Yeah. And I'll also put a link in um, to my YouTube channel, and I have a few playlists of um, of bees uh, that we've, uh, especially for catching swarms. Um, so, um, robbing. So, robbing happens when um, when one hive of bees goes into another hive of bees and steals all their honey. And that is very hard to stop once it started. The way to prevent it, I mean, the bees will prevent it themselves. If it's a strong enough hive, they will prevent invaders from coming in. Um, if it's a weak hive, that's when we have had problems with robbers coming in. What we have done if we notice robbing is we just shut all of the doors. So we close off all of the entrances so that those robber bees can't get in there. But it's once they know that it's there um, and that the hive is weak enough that they can go through the defenses, it's it's tough to stop. So um, so that might that might end up being a, a kind of a lost a lost cause, unfortunately. Great. Well, um, thank you so much, Dr. Jantz, for for talking with us. Um, thank you for everyone for yeah, coming. Yeah. Thanks. Well. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Um, sorry, I seemed a little distracted. There was a lot going on in the chat, so I, I kind of lost my thread a couple times, but I appreciate the invitation and um, yeah, and feel free to contact me if you have any, any other beekeeping questions. Great, okay, I'm gonna end the meeting. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks.